Hi, this is Jason Molesky. In this example, we'll take a look at some experimental designs and determine their scope of inference. A small town dentist wants to know if a daily dose of 500 milligrams of vitamin C will result in fewer canker sores in the mouth than taking no vitamin. The dentist is considering four designs. For whichever design the dentist chooses, suppose she compares the proportion of patients in each group who complain of canker sores. Also, suppose she finds a statistically significant difference with a smaller proportion of those taking vitamin C having canker sores. What can the dentist conclude for each design? Well, suppose for design one, she gets all dental patients in town with appointments in the next two weeks to take part in a study. She gives each patient a survey with two questions. Do you take at least 500 milligrams of vitamin C each day? And do you frequently have canker sores? Based on the answers to question one, she'll divide them into two groups, those who take at least 500 milligrams of vitamin C and those who don't. Well, because the patients weren't randomly selected, the dentist can't infer that this, was a re that this result holds for a larger population of dental patients. This was more of an observational study because no treatments were deliberately imposed on the patients. With no random assignment to the two groups, no inference about cause and effect can be made. The dentist just knows that for these patients who took vitamin C, they had fewer canker sores than those who didn't. For the second design, suppose she gets all dental patients in town with appointments in the next two weeks to take part in the study and randomly assigns half to take vitamin C each day and the other half to abstain from taking vitamin C over the course of three months. Now, like design one, the dentist can't make any inference about this result holding for a larger population of dental patients. However, the treatments were randomly assigned to the subjects. So assuming proper control in the experiment, she can conclude that taking vitamin C reduced the chance of getting canker sores in her, in her subjects. For the third design, suppose she selects a random sample of dental patients in town and gets them to take part in a study, then divides the patients into two groups like design one. Because the patients were randomly selected from the population of dental patients in town, the dentist can generalize the results of the study to the population. And because this was an, uh, an observational study, we have to note that no inference about cause and effect can be made. The dentist would conclude that for population of dental patients in this town, those taking vitamin C have fewer canker sores than those who don't. She can't say whether the vitamin C causes this reduction or some other confounding variable does, because again, this was an observational study. Finally, suppose for design four, she selects a random sample of dental patients in town and gets them to take part in the study. Then she randomly assigns half of them to take 500 milligrams of vitamin C each day and the other half to abstain from taking vitamin C for three months. Well, like design three, the random sampling allows the dentist to generalize the results of this study to the population of dental patients in the town. Like design two, the random assignment allows her to conclude, again, assuming proper control in the experiment, that taking vitamin C reduced the chance of getting canker sores. So the dentist would conclude that for the population of dental patients in this town, those taking vitamin C will tend to have fewer canker sores than those who don't due to the vitamin C. For some additional practice with determining the scope of inference, try exercise 101.